Our scripture this evening is in Psalm 17, verses 1 through 15. God calls us to live for him. Now, it is really, really easy to say that, okay? It is really easy to say, well, you just need to live for God. You know, I, I, I read an article this week about, uh, from, from a guy in, in, that, that was uh, in pastoral ministry and now works in, a, in another calling, and he said basically the things that, that uh, he wished a lot of people that, that go to church knew. And, and one of the things that, that he pointed out what, that, that most pastors really don't do is counseling. And, and those of you that know me know I don't do a lot of counseling. I'm not a trained counselor. I've had two counseling classes. That is not enough for me to sit down and, and try to, to go through uh, uh, some of the issues that a lot of people will deal with. And uh, because... Where I'm at in, in my ability to counsel is it is really easy for me to say, well, you just need to A, or you just need to B. And it's really easy to say that, but it's not so easy to live it. David, as we're going to see in this psalm, is coming very boldly before God. And he is asking God to work a miracle in his life. And the reason that David is asking God to work a miracle this time is because he has seen God work a miracle in his life before. And David comes very boldly before the throne of grace and asks God to move. Psalm 17, verses 1 through 15, and in honor of the reading of God's word, let's stand. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my judgment come forth from your presence. Let your eyes look with equity. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me, and you find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my speech. Wondrously show your loving kindness. O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed their unfeeling heart. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. He is like a lion that is eager to tear and as a young lion lurking in hiding places. Arise, O Lord, confront him, bring him low, deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword, from men with your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life and whose belly you fill with your treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with with your likeness when I awake. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst this evening. And God, we just ask that you would open our hearts and minds and that you would show us how it is that you would have us to live out this great psalm in our lives. Father God, we love you with all of our soul. We trust you with all of our heart, and we offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer. In and through the name of our risen Lord and Master, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, all of us have been in situations where we needed immediate help. We had gotten ourselves into something and, and we didn't know how to get out or, 
or or it was it was just not possible for us to extract ourselves from that situation. We needed someone to intervene to assist us. Let me tell you something. All of us in this room have lived on this earth long enough to know that there are situations, uh, and, and, and some of us may be going through situations in our lives right now that no human being can fix this. They're not going to be able to make this better. They're not going to be able to do anything about it. All we can do is cry out to God and turn it over to him. Now, David found himself in this kind of situation. In fact, most commentators believe that, that this psalm was written while David was on the run from, from, uh, uh, from Saul. And so David is, is, is in a situation, he's got a small army against the army of Israel. And his small army is not going to be able to defeat Israel's army. He knows that. And so David cries out to God. We, we saw in the, in the psalm, we'll get to it in a little bit, uh, but we, we saw in the psalm that David cried out to God in the middle of the night, and God listened to him. He couldn't sleep, and so he went to God and said, God, I, I, I just ask that, that, that you would do this, and, and, and I turn this whole situation over to you. This is the first of five psalms that are identified as a prayer. And the others are Psalm 86, Psalm 90, Psalm 102, and Psalm 142. The Hebrew word for prayer uh, involves intercession and, and intervention. It is, it is not just that I am talking to God, it is that I am interceding. You know, some of us are engaged in an intercessory prayer ministry. We intercede for others. And I believe all of us ought to do that. There ought to be at least one person in all of our lives that we are intercessorily, if that's a word, praying for. That we are interceding before the throne of God for that individual. Especially if that person is lost and, and, and doesn't know Jesus. And see... One of the, the, the major things about an intercessory prayer is asking God to do something. It's not just, God, I've got this lost friend. It is, God, I've got this lost friend, and I pray, oh God, that you would do whatever is necessary to bring them to the point where they will hear and, and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we said that David wrote this psalm while he was... While he was on the run from, from Saul. And most commentators link this to a time when he was trapped in the wilderness of Maon, which we find in 1 Samuel 23, 24, and 25. It says, They arose and went to Ziph before Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon and in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David, and he came down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard it, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. Now, listen to me, beloved. What is David's, you know, what's the issue here? What has David done to Saul? He got anointed as king by Samuel. He didn't ask for it. He didn't seek for it. This was all God's doing. And Saul is chapped. So, listen. Saul did not believe that there should be consequences for his sin. He certainly believed that there should be consequences for everybody else's sin. But what... Did, did Saul do? And it's one of those things the heathen will always throw back in our, our face, right? I'm quoting from the King James, suffer not a witch to live. Because they're saying that we ought to, you know, if we're, if we're going to take Scripture seriously, we need to go around and kill all the witches. Well, that's a whole other sermon. But Saul had outlawed mediums and spiritists in Israel. And what did he do? He went to a medium. He went to a spiritist. And, and listen, God even spoke to him through this illicit means. 
and told him, I have taken the kingdom out of your hand. Now, the only thing left was God didn't do it that day. God could have struck Saul dead that very day. But he allowed Saul to live for another period of time for whatever reason we we don't really know. But anyway, Scripture tells us that Saul and his men surrounded David. But God intervened in the situation in verses 26 through 28. Saul went on one side of the mountain and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what the Bible is saying? David is not looking for a confrontation with Saul. In fact, every time he finds himself in the place where a confrontation is is imminent, David does what? He turns and goes the other way. He will not engage in this confrontation. And it's not just because he's outnumbered. Listen, beloved. Mm -hmm. You remember Elijah? You remember Elijah? And they got mad at him and they sent the army and his servant went out and Elijah said, what do you see? And, and he said, I don't see anything. And he said, go look again. And he came back and he said, I see an angel army. I see an angel army. David could have won with the help of God. God wanted David to be his king. But David never had the permission from God to engage Saul. Anyway, David was hurrying to get away from Saul. For Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize him. Do you understand how close he was? Do you understand how close he was to this whole thing being over? But a messenger came to Saul. Imagine that. (laughs) Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. Why do you think the Philistines went into Israel? Because God told them to. Because God told them to go make a raid on, on that land. Listen, beloved, God can use pagans in his, uh, in his purpose. So Saul returned from pursuing David. See, now, don't you think that made Saul mad? That, that he's going, mm, he could taste victory. He could taste it. Even, listen, even though he knew that he was not going to be the king of Israel much longer, you know what bothered him more than anything else? That kid is, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that kid never, ever sits on the throne of Israel. If Saul couldn't have his way. And and listen to me. Did Saul want to be king? Y'all remember that? Where did they find Saul on coronation day? Hiding. He didn't want to be king. They had to go and say, Saul, get yourself over here and let us put the crown on you. He didn't want to be king in the first place. And now he's doing everything he can. And he's got his mortal enemy almost within his grasp. And the messenger comes and he says, Saul, the Philistines have raided our land. And don't you think Saul is doing the math in his head? Huh? Don't you think he's doing the math in his head? Okay, now wait a minute. Boys, how long do you think it'd take us to get him? I mean, could, could could we get this thing wrapped up? Could we seize David and kill him and all of his men within the next hour? Could, I, is that a thing? Could we do that? Because, listen, Saul knew that it was going to be bad enough when he killed David. Remember the song? Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. The people of Israel loved David because he was God's anointed. And Saul knew that. But he also knew that if your mortal enemy, you know, the one that David defeated, that one, invades your territory and you don't do anything about it, 
you're not going to be king very long. And so out of political expediency, Saul returned from pursuing David and went to meet the Philistines. Therefore, they called that place the Rock of Escape. So it's only by the hand of God that David lived to write this psalm. And so, having said that as the background, that helps you to understand how magnificent this psalm is in its absolute trust of God. David absolutely trusted God. Verses 1 through 5. David begs God to listen to his call. Now listen to me, beloved. Look at that third word. Hear a just cause. That takes a lot of confidence, doesn't it? It takes a lot of confidence when you're being pursued. Now, David knew. David knew all of this about Saul. He knew that God had taken his hand uh, <coughs> excuse me, off of Saul. And he goes before God convinced that he has a just cause. Hear a just cause, Yahweh. Give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. You want, you want a lesson on praying? There it is. Psalm 17, 1. There's your lesson on praying. That you go before God with a, with a just cause. That you go before God crying out to Him, understanding that He's the only one that's going to be able to do something about your situation. And we'll get to why why that second one is important in a little bit. And give ear to my prayer. You go to God in, in, in honesty. How many times we go to God and we only tell Him half of the situation? <laughs> yeah. We only tell God half of what's going on, thinking that He's not going to know about the other half. You go to God with a with an honest with an honest prayer. He was he was absolutely certain that his cause was right and his heart was right. And he prayed with urgency. Now what does that teach us? We got to make sure that our prayer is sincere. That, listen. We've talked about in imprecatory psalms uh, several times up to this point. And you understand, I mean, this one has some imprecation in it. A- a- as we saw at the last of, of this psalm, where, where David is talking about, Arise, O Lord, confront him, bring him low. That's an imprecatory psalm. Before we start praying imprecatory prayers, we need to make sure that it's a just cause. We need to make sure that our prayer is sincere. We need to make make sure that our prayer is not deceitful. David asked God to prick up his ears and listen to him. Listen to him, not not just listen, not just to allow God's eardrums to vibrate. When when, when you see the word listen in Hebrew, it, it doesn't mean just to hear, just to discern the words that are being said. It means to do something about what you've heard. And so David is asking God to get involved in this thing and do something. Now, here's the real question. How could David so firmly insist that God grant what he desired? How can we be confident that God will act on what we desire? His boldness was rooted in the confidence that his cause was right and that his request was not deceitful. Saul would have made a good 20th century politician. 
because he was spreading all kinds of lies about David and his men around Israel. How did David respond? He kept his mouth shut. Now listen, beloved, all of y'all know David well enough from your own study of Scripture to know that that had to be the hardest thing David had ever done in his life. It had to be the hardest thing that he had ever done. David was not one to back down from a fight. David pleaded with God to hear and judge according to the truth. Let me say that again. David pleaded with God to hear and to judge according to the truth. Not just David's understanding of the truth. Does that make sense? Sometimes we don't have a full understanding of the situation. Second, David was convinced that his motive was right. He prayed honestly and sincerely for God to act in accordance with His divine will. So when we begin praying those imprecatory prayers, are are, are we singing the modern version of of that song? You know, my boyfriend's back and you're going to be sorry. Are we saying God is back and you're going to be sorry? Are we looking for God to, you know, to just embarrass them publicly or or whatever so that we can just kind of step back and and go, "Mm, there you go, Mm, that'll, that'll teach you to mess with me. Or are we after something more? Are we after God's glory? Are we after Listen, beloved, sometimes an imprecatory prayer is the only way for God to deal with this individual and restore them. To restore them. I have prayed, bring them to their knees. We saw that in our psalm tonight. David prayed that same prayer. But the reason I prayed it was, God, bring them to their knees in repentance. Because, God, from what I've seen, and I'm not the judge, praise Jesus, I'm not the judge, but from what I've seen, I'm worried about their salvation. Now, y'all are going, is he talking about me? I am not. Okay. I haven't prayed that prayer over anybody in this room. But what I'm telling you, beloved, is that when we pray these kind of prayers, it has to be for God's glory. And we also, also have to understand that the ultimate goal was repentance. Now, you're saying, but wait, preacher, I I don't see that David is praying for repentance in, in Saul's life. He's not. Why not? Because there is no repentance for Saul. He's done what he's done. He he, he deliberately disobeyed the word of God. And there's not going to be any coming back from that. God knows there's not going to be any coming back in Saul's life. And so there's not a need for David to pray for repentance. Third, David was confident that God would do what was right. Hmm. Man, isn't that hard? When we just say, God, I'm turning all of this over to you. And I trust, I know that you're going to do what is right. And we are willing to accept whatever it is God does when we pray that prayer. Verses 3 through 5. This is a hard thing. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you you find nothing. 
Is David claiming sinless perfection here? He is not. What he is saying is, God, I have been honest with you in my feelings about this situation. I have been honest with you about my motives in this situation. And I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. It's a bad example, but I purpose to walk to the back door. What's wrong? I'm not doing anything about it. I got a purpose. I got a desire to walk to the back door. But until I do something about it, then that purpose is of no good. And David says, I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. How many of y'all think that at some point in his life, David had the biggest tongue in all of Israel? You know what I'm saying? That he had to bite it so many times? When he had the opportunity to talk smack about Saul? He, listen, he even had to call his own men down. His own men were talking smack about Saul at various points. And David said, wait, 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 wait. Don't you dare talk about God's anointed that way. And they're going, but Dave, there he's chasing you. David says, I don't care. He's God's anointed. Until God deals with this situation, he is God's man, and I nor you are not going to transgress against him. And he says, as for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips I have kept from the paths of the violent. You understand what David is saying? He's saying that he's living out Scripture. By the word of your lips. David knew scripture. And he's living it out. He says, God said I can do this. And God said I can't do this. And so by the word of the Lord, that is how I'm going to order my life. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. David is saying that his entire life Life is ordered around the Word of God. Now, let's revisit what he said in verse 3. You have visited me by night. It's just David and God. David and God all alone and having this conversation it is just the two of them. And it was there that God relieved David's spirit and declared him innocent. As David searched his own heart in the silence of the night, God had given him peace. I said, as David searched his own heart in the silence of the night, God had given him peace. Remember this morning, right before we, we partook of the Lord's Supper? And I prayed, God, if there is any unconfessed sin in our life, would you bring it to our attention? I got to imagine that would have been a difficult night for David to just sit and, and allow God to bring all of this unconfessed sin to the surface. And David then having to say, Lord, thank you for, for bringing that to my mind. Thank you for bringing that up. God, I just confess of that. I repent of that. And listen to me, beloved. Is David able to go make a sacrifice, a sin offering at this point? He's not. He's not able to go and, and offer a, a lamb or a goat or, or anything. He is trusting that God has, has forgiven him of his sin. Not only was David guiltless in his heart towards Saul, but his mouth was pure as well. I tell you what, let's not dwell on that one, shall we? Man, I struggle with that. I struggle with keeping my mouth from transgressing. 
Sometimes I feel like the only reason I open my mouth is to change feet. Can I get a witness? <laughs> okay. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. And listen, beloved, that, that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. David, verse 4. David had also uh, kept God's word in his behavior toward his enemies. His ways were pure. He was not asking God, whose character is perfectly righteous and just, to act unrighteously. Hmm. Have we ever asked God to act unrighteously on our behalf? David would not ask God to do that. We need to be very careful about what we say and what we pray, especially regarding those who oppose us or persecute us. You know, here's the problem. We're often guilty of asking in the wrong way. James 4, 3, we all know this verse. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Do you understand what James is saying right there? If you'd ask with the right motives, you'd have it. If you'd ask with the right motive, you would have what you had asked for. But you're asking with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And, you know, obviously there's a financial component to this. But how many of y'all are like me? And you just wish everybody else would be reasonable and see things our way. Can I get a witness? You know, just be reasonable and, and see things my way. This whole thing will be over just like that if you would just recognize that I'm right. It can be difficult for us to recognize those few times that we're wrong. David asked God to thoroughly search him, to investigate his entire being and expose any defilement or sin. And only then could he pray with the confidence and boldness that he displayed in this psalm. God had given him a peace that was innocent. So then with the full assurance that what he was doing was in God's will, he prayed with daring determination. John put it this way in 1 John 5, 14. I love this. This is the confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything, he hears us. I left something out, didn't I? Why did I do that? Because that's the way we generally pray it. We don't say, God, if this be in your will, and God, I am 100% on board, whatever your will is, if your answer is yes, hallelujah, I will praise you. If your answer is no, hallelujah, I will praise you. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us because we're coming to God with a clean heart. This is important. Doing right is the result of resolving or choosing to do right. We do not automatically obey God. We have to resolve to walk in obedience to God. And that is especially true with regard to our enemies. Verses 6 through 12. David asked God to give his full attention to a second crucial matter. He asked God to shelter him from those individuals that were seeking to destroy him. He appealed to God's faithfulness. Show, verse 7, show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand. What does this uh, mean to us? 
we must believe and declare that God will hear and answer our prayer. But that sometimes means the answer to our prayer is no. And we very frequently take an answer of no as no answer. David was secure in his right to call upon God to rescue him. He knew that God would answer him. How how did he know that? What was the whole point of the Samuel thing? If, if, listen, if God is going to allow his next anointed king to be killed by the rebellious king, then what was the point of sending Samuel to find him and to anoint him as king? David knew that God was not setting him up. And listen, how many of y'all, if I threw a spear at you, would be okay with that? Anybody here? How many if I threw a spear at you twice would be okay with that? Okay, we had a saying in the Marine Corps. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And yet David would not rise up against Saul because David knew that he was standing in God's covenant as one of God's chosen, beloved children. Do you know what we need to do? We need to do verse 7. Ask God to wondrously show us his loving kindness. Have you ever prayed for God to do that? It's scriptural. You're just praying God's word back to him. God loves to hear his word prayed back to him. David boldly called on God to perform a miracle for him. His plea was urgent. God had done it before. And David called upon him to do it again. We need to ask God to keep us as the apple of his eye. You know, the one thing on your head that you will protect more than anything else is your eyes, right? If I start coming towards your face, you're, you're going to do something to try to protect your eyes. And David is saying, God, as you would protect your eyes, protect me and hide me in the shadow of your wings. Oh, we need to turn to God and ask God to keep us in his nurturing love. This image is throughout Scripture, but Jesus even talked about it in Matthew 23, 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together and shelter you under the shadow of my wings. That's not what he says, but it's what he means. The way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. You were unwilling. You were unwilling. God wanted to make it better. But they weren't willing for God to do it his way. David needed God's sheltering care because his enemies were fierce and ruthless. And they would not rest until they had murdered him. Now, we understand that the root sin in Saul's life here was jealousy. He was angry. He was angry that that there were consequences for his sin. Man, we need to teach our children that. That there are consequences for sin. It doesn't matter who you are, there are consequences for sin. And so Saul said, well, if I can't have the throne, then I'm going to make sure David doesn't have it as well. And he pursued him relentlessly. If we live in obedience to God, we should expect to suffer for doing his will. Jesus warned his disciples of persecution in Matthew 5, verses 10 and 11. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for being ornery. No, that's not what Jesus said. He said, for those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness... 
for the glory of God's name. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. John 15, 20, he said, Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Jesus wants us to understand what it's going to be like. Peter encouraged believers in, in 1 Peter 4, 16. He says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. And then in verse 19, he says, therefore those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. In doing what is right. Verses 13 through 15. Through eyes of faith, David looked beyond his current situation to what lay in store for his enemies and for himself. You know? How many of y'all have ever, your children were going through something and they'd say, Ma! or dad I'm dying you are not dying okay you are not dying it's going to be okay it's going to be okay you'll be through this in, in a little while and David is taking the long view on this he understands he's not dying because he's in God's hand and he's taking his eyes off of the situation and putting his eyes onto, more importantly, what's in store for him. David prayed that God would intervene. Because, listen to me. He understood. He understood that he and they both would one day stand before God. And, and, and listen to what he says. Verse 14, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. In other words, they are living just for this life. And whose belly you fill with your treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. How many of you all have ever seen a, a hearse carrying a, a U-Haul trailer behind it? He's saying they leave everything they worked all of their life for to somebody that doesn't even know how to manage it. As for me, they can do what they want to. But as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Notice another contrast between the wicked and the righteous in verse 14 and 15. In verse 14, they're full. And in verse 15, we have satisfied. That's the same Hebrew word. The wicked only have an appetite for the things of this world. The righteous crave something greater. They hunger for the presence of God. Every individual chooses their own destiny. How we choose to live in the present determines how we will live in the future. Let me say that again. How we choose to live in the present determines how we will live in the future. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3, 9. <coughs> Excuse me, he says, he wanted to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. As true believers, we are citizens of another world. We are citizens of a heavenly world. 
We should long for the return of Christ who's going to transport us into the glorious presence of God. Philippians 3, 19 through 21. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame. Who set their minds on earthly things. That's the people that David is talking about. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Do you understand? It's all in Jesus' hands. Paul encouraged the Colossians to set their affection on the things of heaven in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Let me ask you a question. Beloved, if you had coded, if you honest to goodness had died, okay, Dead, dead, dead in a hammer, you were dead. They had pronounced you. They had written it on a death certificate. And you came back to life. Would you go back to doing things the way that you'd done it before? I don't think so. You'd be a completely different person. Beloved, the Bible tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. And we have been raised up with Christ. And because of that, we need to keep seeking the things above and set our mind on the things above, not on the things on this earth. Everything in this world will pass away. We are called to live for heaven. And long for the Lord's presence. What a glorious future awaits the children of God. And that, beloved, is how we shelter under the shadow of his wings.